All right, hello. Um, here's the weekly meeting for Live Embedded Hell. All right, this is the meeting for December 14th. Make sure I got that right. It's 15th, actually. So this is actually 14th is when I made these last slides. I need to change this to 15, though. All right, so the TLDR highlights and the agenda we're going to be going over. So a couple, I'm just going to go over an update on SJW2. We're still working on the CAN bus driver for the STM32 F4. The current issue with it is the fact that it, we don't have a really good way of testing it. Uh, that's pretty much it, pretty much the biggest issue. We have our motors and we have, you know, uh, logic analyzers, but those aren't usually the best systems. And we don't really have a real way to... Well, we want more ways to be able to test everything to know that it works at different frequencies. So like in the bus frequency could be one, um, 100,000 hertz, or uh, sorry, 100 kilohertz, 400 kilohertz, 500 kilohertz, a whole variety of different types of, you know, kilohertz. And then also for the motor, it's one mega, uh, one megahertz, um, uh, for the, for the baud rate. And I discovered that the actual previous driver only works at one megahertz and does not work at like hundred kilohertz, which is strange because the default. So that's a problem. Um, uh, new docs hot off the press and a new logo. I'll show you guys that in a sec. I'm really excited about that. We have docs, lint, test, and git uh, all as part of our git action uh, flow, our git actions workflows. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go over error handling using Leaf, and it's actually funny because I discovered some new information about Leaf a second ago, but we'll go into that in a little bit. And last little part here is gonna talk about help needed on Lib Embedded Hell. Um, uh, yeah, we're gonna go through like a couple of things that are currently things that like I want to open up the floodgates to people helping out with and you know doing stuff with so we'll kind of take a look here all right so new docs and new logo so over here uh, on the right hand side and I may actually change the SVG but I think it might I think it still looks pretty cute uh, I still don't like how the pins look but this is basically the logo I'm big enough for a living better how I'm not sure if I'll put anything in the middle here like SJ2 or SJ or something like that but for now this little isometric SVG uh, minimalist chip is kind of the uh, logo for Live Embedded Hal. Kind of just found that online on like a um, common um, uh, Creative Commons website. Is either Creative Commons or something else, something licensed like that. Um, I'm gonna go. Uh, um, there's also a fresh new look for Live Embedded Hal compared to SJ Dev 2. I think both of them look really nice, but uh, you guys will see how this one looks. We might have already seen it if you were on the Discord. Uh, Oh, and uh, just an FYI, this uh, meeting is being recorded, as I said before, so just keep that in mind. Um, yes, so uh, docs, uh, they pretty much should encompass and probably not even be limited to the setup and install, how to use Live Embedded, uh, Live Embedded Hall in practice, uh, things like, you know, how to do error handling, how to create multi-application um, uh, apps, how to even just use the interfaces in general, um, outside of thinking about the implementation because you shouldn't actually even need to know about the implementation in order to use any, any of the drivers. Uh, maybe the getters, um, so you know like which the pins are, but that's a little, let's, let's get into, into the weeds. Hardware Basics tutorial, um, like you know, I think it doesn't, I, I feel like it'd be possible to actually make hardware tutorials built into Lib Embedded Hal's documentation. So if you didn't know anything about uh, how to how, what a GPIO was or an ADC is, you could learn that. That way, if you only know of a couple things inside of you know embedded systems, let's say GPIO, PWM, and ADC, you can then learn what I2C, Serial, and SPI are from like looking at tutorials that explain it to you. Similar to how SparkFun and like uh, Adafruit would do it. Um, we could also just link to their pages as well. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, as long as we have a collection, I think having a collection there and just saying, hey, here's a, here's a tutorial on like how to learn this from SparkFun. And then here's a tutorial about how to use the actual driver once you understand how the fundamentals work. So I think both of those are perfectly valid. And one of them is actually a lot simpler and easier for us anyway. Okay. Um, design documentation's on there as well. API documentation, full guides for adding platforms and drivers of the ecosystem, and, and uh, contribution guides. None of these are filled up at the moment. And uh, I want to give a little, yeah. So none of that, all this is empty at the moment, except for the API documentation. Um, uh, Doxygen API documentation integration provided by Doxy, Doxy Book 2. That is a crazy sentence to kind of read. Doxygen API documentation. But uh, the next thing, the last bullet here is check out the new docs. I'm going to go over to them right now. So let's click on this. And I think I need to switch. Yeah, let me just go full screen, actually. Let's 
Change window, let's go full screen. Let's do everything here. All right, so that make sure, that'll make it a lot easier. Okay. Um, so yeah, we have the little logo here. It's, it's an SVG, so it doesn't look as crappy as it did on the slides. Um, if you actually click on the docs button here, it actually does bring you to, oh, it does not bring you to the docs. Never mind, I need to change that. Uh, but if you click on this button here, it brings you to the docs. This is the new look. Uh, I know we had a survey on like what color should be used. Uh, the number one primary color was green. The secondary color was purple. Although people wanted me to customize the purple because the dark purple was too dark. And at that point I was like, all right, that might be a little bit of effort. Maybe in the future, if we make a new version, you know, we change the color or something like that. That might be a way to indicate that we've upgraded from limited how one to two to three to four to whatever until we run out of reasonable colors. So here's the home screen, nothing here to be determined. Uh, installation's got a couple lists like getting started, flashing, debugging, exploring, uh, how to find more things. Um, more guides, create a project, how to use drivers, error handling, uh, multi-application, uh, multi-platform applications, unit testing, uh, with, our, with everything we're building. I think the thing that's probably most important, or like not most important, the most filled out, actually completely filled out, and uh, um, and actually available at, at the moment is you can go to the API. You can then look at you know it's kind of explaining to you what things are what. But you can start actually looking up how these things are how are things are used. Although ADC for some what for whatever reason does not work. It just it's, it looks like it's being forward declared and then can't find the actual implementation. I don't know why that is because they're connected, but this is a problem. I got to solve it at some point. But if we go over something like can. You can see that has a couple of yeah you have your message structure you have your can ID struct, uh, uh, type definition you have a function for send has data receive attach interrupt and then all like things that are inherited from driver um, and actually let me see something there should be a dash in here there's no dash hmm strange oh no there's a dash here the dashes are here they removed them up here or did they yeah they did. Wow, I don't know why the the the, the tech the why there's this, like no space here. Someone else thinking about fixing at some point or work uh, contributing back to Doxy book. But yeah, so you can see all the different detail, uh, all the different like document, bits of documentation for all the interfaces, and it explains to you exactly what's supposed to happen. So you have to pretty much, if you're developing this thing, you need to make sure that you develop it uh, to spec, and this is basically the spec. Um, and yeah, we have all the different classes in here. So uh, embed SPI and so on and so forth. So you can see all the things that you can do with SPI. Oops. Oh, that should needs to be fixed. That should just locate down to a lower level here versus that. So I didn't realize that that was a problem. So that's so things need to be fixed up with this. Not perfect. A lot of things don't go anywhere. Um, in this case, also we have like the more so Conan. This goes nowhere. Uh, but the, I want this to go to the Conan center so you can actually you know look for different lib embedded HAL projects that are tagged with lib embedded HAL. Same with VC package. That'll be a lot later before we get that developed uh, ready. And then GitHub, some showcases, maybe some projects that people have worked on, and then credits. Alrighty. Um, any questions about the docs or the logo? Cool, cool. All right. Moving on. Uh, all right. So docs, lint, test integration, Git action, workflows. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to kind of go through through them, or at least what they do. You can actually, if you uh, if you have access to the slides, um, you can just click on this and you can actually look at them. Or you can go to Lib Embedded HAL, SJW to Lib Embedded HAL on GitHub and you can see the workflows there. But I'm just gonna explain to you what they actually just do. So docs, so not only does it generate the actual documentation that you saw before with Doxygen and Hugo and, I'm sorry, the name of the new system we're using for our web page to generate our static web page is called Hugo. Just a little tidbit there. But the creation of our documentation uh, built-in Hugo and all this like that. All your steps can actually fail. Like if Hugo feels that like some part of the content doesn't make any sense, it'll fail there and then um, ensure that we fix that before we actually deploy it. But the thing that really affects our actual code quality and our code would be the third party, um, sorry, the verification of all documentation um, except for third party libraries. So you actually can't make a new API or make new code and get it submitted if it does not if it's not fully documented and that includes like the class, you know, defining what the class is and how it works and stuff like that. But I think everyone here probably understands that, but that's kind of the thing that gets checked. So as part of the pre submit or like the submission um, requests or uh, uh, requirements. Next up we have lint. Um, so the first thing we do is like everything should be, should follow clang format. 
to a T. So we actually, I, so the uh, the linting system will run clean format. Uh, there's a flag you can switch that basically turns it on if it actually does any work, and that's basically a way to detect if clean format discovers that your code is not formatted correctly. And there's a couple benefits to this because this actually acts like CPP claim, uh, CPP check, which is the Google style guide, trying to get the Google style guide to kind of fit. Yeah, trying to get it to to fit like you know other style guides that aren't uh, Google is prop is difficult, and actually a lot of work. So so much work that it's kind of unnecessary. When if all I want to do is keep the style nice, then this will do it for me. It does it does do some other checks. It does do a lot more other helpful checks that I'll probably be adding in later. But for now, a uh, clean format kind of helps get the style of the file correct. Um, so it checks to see if it if it could change the file and update it compared to the actual file. And if it does not work, it fails. Next up, we have spell checking. Um, we had to use a C spell for that. Um, so we check the spelling for your code. Uh, but you may need to add some items to the dictionary if they if they don't exist. And then fast name convention, uh, sorry, fast name convention checking with NCC, name convention checker. Uh, it is way faster than uh, Clang Tidy, even though I did a lot of things to improve and uh, improve and increase the speed, like multi-threading and cutting out a whole bunch of different includes and you know all that kind of junk. Uh, this thing blows out of the water on a single thread, so. Um, way better than what we had before. Lastly, we build and run our te unit tests, and that's pretty much that. Um, I'm probably missing some items that we had from SJ Dev 2, so I will be adding them, those in um, uh, as time goes forward and making sure that the unit tests are as fast as possible. I'd say that most of the unit tests take... Um, I actually don't know, but I feel like they're like maybe a minute, two minutes. I don't think they're like the seven minutes we had before or five minutes that we had before, and the 45 minutes we had before when we were really not, when I really hadn't optimized everything. So yeah, I think we're in a much better place. Oh, uh, any questions on this before I move forward? Cool. Alrighty, so error handling using leaf. Now this is probably the, we can check this slide next, yeah. This is probably the most intense update for the project and uh, our, like just, yeah, I think it just in general, like out of all the things we're talking about today, I think this is a pretty big one. Um, so before I get into this, um, I have been talking with the creator of Leaf on the CPP Slack, uh, which is our CPP Lang Slack which has been super helpful because they've been uh, very helpful in telling me like, you know, what things to look out for and how to do things certain, uh, uh, in a certain way. And they've actually even made an update where they're able to shave off more uh, more of the binary size by being a little bit more aggressive about their if defing when it came to turning off threading. But then a particular question came into my mind, which was that, hey, you know, since you know you have a threading system, uh, you know, if I, if I, I can't enable your threading system because you're using the standard library thread, which we don't get inside of ARM GCC. And what happens if I turn that off, but then also still use multi-threaded, like, you know, free RTOS or ThreadX or something like that. And the guy said, yeah, you just can't do that. Like, that's that's not going to work. And I was like, mm, I don't know if I can use it then. So I, we're working on, an, on a way to get around this. So basically, I, we've been talking about a solution on how to get through this. So I'll get into what the actual leaf is uh, before I ramble on more about what, how I'm contributing to it or how I am looking at ways to try to well, make this thing work for embedded, uh, which I think is kind of exciting, but uh, yeah. So um, I've been going back and forth b uh, between local error handling, which is the return type handling. So if you remember, if you know about ex uh, std expected or very basically just returning an error code, like an integer and the integer is like, you know, if it's zero, it means it's fine. If it's non-zero negative or positive, it means something went wrong uh, versus uh, central error handling, which is exceptions for the most part. Um, local meaning that like, you know, you, like, you have to kind of move it back and forth between spots, whereas exception is supposed to jump from one location to another location. You have a central place that thing that handles everything. You may have multiple central spots, but like you, know, you have a little cage in which all errors kind of funnel through it. Um, uh, Leaf is it uses the return type mechanism, but it's actually central in its error handling, which is kind of interesting, and it does not require exceptions to make it work. Uh, I'll show you some some examples of that in a sec. But for now, 
uh, why I'm moving away from exceptions and going back to lo local error handling. Uh, we actually did something similar to that before and I saw a lot of code bloat due to it. So uh, a couple of reasons why I want to move to Leaf. Number one, this will result in greater adoption from users. I knew that from the start when I moved away, when we moved to exceptions that like I was, I was isolating or, um, I'm not isolating, I guess, I guess that's the right word. Isolating my, uh, my, my potential user, uh, uh, future developers and users because they would not accept exceptions. And the thing is, I understood that like, it wasn't like, oh, they were wrong. I need to educate them. It was very much a, I, you like you know it does not work for your use case you, you're like you know you're trying to use a safe system um, um, you want to you want to write safe code and they're like when you look at like medical safety code which I don't know if our code's gonna be used for that but let's say it was they just could not use exceptions like they, like they, like they are not allowed to buy the by the biomedical uh, protocols that are at, at B so basically uh, and then there's also these people who won't use them in general and all that stuff like that and there's also the code cost and bloat and stuff like that, that you have to deal with and the horrendously long amount of time it takes to throw and then, you know, get into a catch. So, yeah. Exceptions have a lot of problems. I've been reading, a, I did some further research on exceptions. And a lot of people explained how it's very problematic. Things I just explained before. But also how it shields things. It's a lot of the reasons why exceptions, you know, kind of people are trying to eat them. Even though it makes your code so much nicer to read. Um, and, and I actually fully, this is my statement here. I feel like if you have exceptions and you have a large enough system and you're using uh, return codes everywhere, um, that will result in more a uh, bigger binary. Um, and I believe that that binary is going to be big is, is is not just bigger in size, but like oh, it's bigger in size. But also, you lose performance. Your speed goes down as well because you're doing comparisons literally every little line that you talk with the interface. Whereas exceptions have a really fast hot path. And an extraordinarily slow, slow, uh, low pass, uh, um, um, uh, like sad, sad path, meaning that when the exception gets thrown. But the thing is, I'm pretty sure that like it all kind of averages whenever, like I don't want to say averages out, but basically, I think that there, there is, there's going to need to be a performance cost for doing things safely. And that's just how how it is. Like I did, I think what I needed to do is kind of grow up from what I was doing before and just say that this is just how the world is. Uh, it's going to take perform. We're going to have a performance cost for the fact that we're doing type safe, uh, st safety. And if you need to get around that safety, then you need to probably write your own special implementation for like a driver uh, to get around that. So, uh, yes, uh, I'm forgoing a little bit of performance. I'm for I'm getting I'm gaining back a lot of performance when it comes to error calling, and I we lose on on code size after a project gets big enough. Um, next up. Leaf makes making handlers have the same flavor as try catch. I'll show you that in a sec. Uh, and then leaf, um, why leaf? Well, let's look into it a little bit. All right, you guys all see this? You guys seeing the the page? Yeah. Cool, cool. All right, so we have the little abstract here. Uh, let's zoom in a little more. So Boost Leaf is a lightweight error handling library for C plus plus eleven and and above. It stands for lightweight error augmentation framework, and um, a couple of nice things. One is single header format, no dependencies, uh, designed for maximum efficiency for happy path and sad path. Um, no dynamic memory allocations, even with heavy payloads, which I, I started discovering the, the the actual scope of what it means to like have a uh, heavy payload at the end of this. Um, I'll get into, get into that in a sec. Um, one of the craziest things that I read in this was O of one transport of arbitrary error types. Okay, so that one right there, because the other the other ones like support multi threads, yeah, it's fine. Uh, can be used with uh with or without exceptions. We're not using exceptions anyway, so it's not important. So these last two are not uh, not not super important to me. But this one right here didn't make any sense because I think to myself like, well, you know, with this stood expected or stood out or boost outcome or basically when you or even with even with error codes, if you're just returning back an int, if you're if you're like you know a thousand stack depth deep, and you need to return a value up, you need to return it a thousand times up. It's O of n. If you have it, if you're doing exceptions, Lord have mercy. 
But yeah, no, you would have to unravel the entire stack all a thousand times to get back up to the top. This one says that arbit in regardless of the of the call stack depth, it's always O of one. It's always one operation. And I'm gonna show you some stuff, and I think it'll like I'll explain it as we get through it. But yeah, this is actually a true statement, and uh, it does not matter what the size of the actual payload is. Um, but yeah, I'll get into why that is in a sec. Uh, but I was very impressed by that little statement there, and I was wondering if it really held up true. And I've been digging through the code to figure out some things. All right, so uh, you no longer have to like so with uh, shade up two when we had error types. We, had a, we made our own result type, or returns type. And with that returns type, was a set expected with an error type. With leaf, you actually never put in an error type. You, you just use result and whatever the type you need. Um, the other field is basically an error ID, which is generated once this thing is uh, created. So if you detect some error, do leaf, new error, put in your error enumeration. And yeah, but the thing is, no, you can pass any error object of any type anything you can put whatever the hell you want here it does not matter you can put anything you want here um and you can do check you can check for them see if there's any issues here and otherwise you can return up an error um there's some boilerplate to make your life a little easier um uh basically a way to assign a uh, take a function that returns a result and assign it to a variable and if not return it uh i i'm probably going to contribute to this project and add in the capability to return uh, the value directly to the value here. Um, just because like this is really gross to look at. It's hard to understand what's happening here. And this doesn't make a lot of sense. Like boost leaf auto. I don't know what that means. Um, but there's like, I think we can, we can truncate that. Um, and then here it gets a little more interesting. But before we get to the error handling portion, which is a little bit long, I'm going to go over this one part right here, which is actually nothing that blew my mind. Um, actually, not different error types. Yeah. Working with multiple error types, if you, wait, hold, on, hold on, yeah, yeah. If you have an error, you can send two error objects, whatever that means to you. You can send two error objects. You can send n number of error objects as you please. Um, and I'm going to show you an example that I put together where, like, if you wanted to, you could put a string. So you could put, like, you know, your enumeration, your string, and then some context data, or... You could do all of that plus another fourth or fifth or sixth thing. It doesn't matter. You can kind of add any context you want. And the thing is, as it bubbles up, it can actually, you can actually attach more things to the to that to payload. And then that little, and then we go into the error handling portion, you can actually disambiguate depending on uh, whatever matches first and some other things like that. But that's kind of the cool thing here is that like you can kind of, you know, do a lot of, a lot with this. Uh, and you can throw however arbitrary number of errors you'd like. So let's look at uh, how we do some handling. And uh, if you guys get confused at any point, please just unmute and, you know, uh, say something. All right. Okay, so we have some function named F1 and F2. They both can, can return an error. We use boof le uh, boost leaf auto in order to grab one uh, value, grab another variable, and then, you know, put them all together in G and do something with that and return uh, to return something. If any one of these errors out, well, one of our, our handler will be run. So the first thing in this function called try handler sum, you give it a lambda, you give it a function, it doesn't have to be a lambda, but you can give it a function uh, to run that can do some operations that can create an error. You can actually put the function uh, like like directly in here if you know what function you're trying to call if you wanted to um, The other things you put in here are the handlers kind of like think of these as catches So they are lambdas, but think of them as catches and in this case We're gonna try to catch for error one. So if error one pops up We're gonna it's going to execute this particular function. And it's gonna continue on from here And it's gonna do its thing where however you have your handler set up and if it fails to actually do any work, then it will return back a result to you. So return the error in some way or just to return something. The expectation is that, um, before I go any further, is that like this either returns a you, so the thing can say, oh, it's been handled. Or it returns back an error, no other thing can match, and then it goes back over here. And then something else can check R to see if R is, um, um, is problematic. And if so, do something about it. Um, so there's that. 
And in this case, just just like a typical, um, just in typical ca uh, try catch fashion, you can have multiple handlers. So here we have this matcher, which actually allows you to not just match what type it is, but also match it against a specific value. And remember, these could be these don't have to be enumerations; they could be objects. So you basically say, hey, if is like if the error that was sent up, does it match? Well, this is E1. Let's say E1. Let's say this is I2C, and it's like, oh, address uh, address uh, arbit uh, address acknowledge failure, or bus error, or um, uh, arbitration lost. Like if it's arbitration lost, do this. If it's bus error, do this. And all you have to do is have like one enumeration that has a couple of set of things in it, and then boom, you like you know you can match against a specific thing. Uh, but if that doesn't work, then you can run the the uh, the main uh, error handler here, uh, and this is in order. So like if the first one that it matches with that it can work, it will do its thing. Uh, but if this thing returns an error, then it goes down to here, and I uh, I believe, and then it kind of does its thing as it bubbles down. And if it gets to the end, then it basically throws the error result type back over here. Um, it does look. I, I will say it does look confusing at first. But if you think about it, like a typical try and a catch and a, and a set of catches, then I think it makes a little more sense. And the handle always means that you need to have like a default case, a finally case, if, it all, if everything else fails. Um, or if none of these actually fit. Um, and yeah, so I'm actually going to move over here to show you like this little example. Um... So I've been playing around with this thing. I'm gonna go over to GCC. Compile you. Okay. Alrighty. So hello world, error state, destructor of state, blah, 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 so on and so forth. So I'm gonna kind of scroll up so you can see the kind of the functions here. So we have like the stage one, which uh, has, a re uh, has a result float. Um, you can, these are just a way to get a call stack. Uh, no, I'm not doing anything special here. Just, I kind of threw that in there. Uh, this is called stage two. Sorry, sorry call stage three. A4. And then we're at four. Here, when we fail, we return error to some value error to. Um, and that's pretty much that. And... Yeah, no, so we get error two, and I think at this time, I think I have it set up to not fail. Um, yeah, I put it as false, uh, it's true here. So put it as false. Yeah, so this is it not failing, so this is just returning back 0 0.1. And then when it fails, it'll run uh, this error two callback and run this little example here. Um, if I were to switch this to, uh, to, um, uh, to E1, then you'll see that down here, it should say unknown error detected. Yeah, unknown error detected, because it had to skip over this one because it, it wasn't the right type. And then if we will scroll up a little bit more, we can actually see uh, this little, like, I, I took this, it basically, it's supposed to calculate a square, but you can throw in like arbitrary numbers, and you know, I like certain ranges where if it's within that range, it throws an error instead. So we have error one, error two, and then this error one, but with an error message, because you can just create a struct, put a string view in there, throw in your message, and it can check for that. So if we go down here, we actually see we have error one and we have error message. So if I move this thing down to, let's see. So this one is all, so it says unknown. So let's do 205. Unknown error detected. Hmm. Oh, I think that might be the other one. Um, hold on. Square. Oh, right, right. Sorry, it's over here. I should probably put like a puts here. We'll put a puts. Puts. Oopsie daisy. Puts here to give me a no, no. Give me some space because actually I don't want to put that there. I want to move it here. 
Yeah, just to give me some space between these two. Because I got confused. I legitimately got confused. Um, all right. So let's move this over here as well. Not super important. Um, yeah. So here we can see like error two detected. Uh, yeah. So error two detected. So um, it did not say error two. Oh, sorry. It says error two detected, but not say. Oh, wait. Because I'm on the wrong one. So go back to 300. Maybe this one it should say air with string so yeah so air with string and then we can actually print out the extra info there and i mean shoot what if we wanted to actually put in the the actual integer value um we put this part of the interface like hey this these are the things that'll get sent back um so i will actually put in the num the number and this is important because uh one of the things that they say in, uh, that the guy created the person who let, created leaf says in the white paper is that like most of your errors come from the context in which the error either was called, which is inside of it, or from the caller. For example, if you're trying to open up a file, you probably don't want your file opening API to log ever. Uh, and, you, and you may not even want it to do too much crazy stuff when it comes to delivering errors. But the thing is, you know the error happened because it returned back like false. It's, oh, it, it failed. And you can say, all right, well, it's this file. It's this these rewrite permissions, all this type of stuff that can be changed. So what I'm actually going to do here, and notice how this thing actually still gave me extra info, even though I have this, because it doesn't need to match it perfectly. It just needs to match the uh, needs to match enough. Um, so I'm actually going to put in int uh, uh, value, and I'm going to put that in as another value here. What the heck was that? Okay. Yeah, so you can actually see 305. I'm, I'm going to put in 320. And then there you go. So we actually hoisted up the information from that integer um, up to, you know, this error handler here. And you can put in, in again, an arbitrary number of things into these uh, in, into your error, into your errors. Um, so if you need a lot of context, you can throw that all in here. Um, now, yeah, so that's a thing that you can do. The one, there's one thing that I was trying, I was kind of curious about. I, I didn't understand how he got, how this person got, um, I keep saying he for some reason. I don't know this, I don't know this person's gender. Um, I, I kept trying to find out how this person got O of 1 transport. And honestly, it comes down to this. Right when you create the error, in this context, there is a somewhat of a global, I'm working on this, uh, somewhat of a global variable that has like a, uh, you can think of it kind of just like a pointer to where all these different uh, bits of data are located. And it writes all that data into these at this stage. Then just, and then this little return thing just has like, you know, the type and like, you know, integer. Uh, or like, you know, just an, an ID number for the error. And once you bubble up all the way, like as you do a normal return, you get to this point. Uh, it already has all the data in the right location. So it's not like when you do a normal bubble up where you have to copy and copy and copy and copy and copy for a thousand iterations up. You only go to the bottom, make that one copy, that one creation there, and then you bubble all the way up to the top normally. Uh, this is why having high, huge payloads isn't super important. For example, well, uh, for one, let's say you have like a gigantic matrix. Um, well... <laughs> You probably allocate that dynamically, not going to lie. Uh, and then in which case you just pass up the pointer and that's easy enough to deal with. Uh, but let's say for, for just, just for chat, for just for, just for the sake of this argument, you have this gigantic object and you want to pass it by, I guess, value for some reason. You want to pass it by value uh, through this error system. So, you, so it creates a copy of that huge system. Um, creates a huge copy of it. And it only takes that one copy. Then once you go all the way up, bubble all the way up the stack, you can then mess with that or use it or inspect it as much as you like. Um, shoot, that could even be an a a a, a, a um, register a register dump. Like like you could have you could pass and register. Like I don't know if you have one cache, but if you have a cache register dump for some system, you could just send that all your way up. I think that's a bit much. I don't know if that's a good idea, but that's something that one could do with this system. 
Um, uh, so yeah, that's kind of leaf air handling. And, and keep in mind, for those who are developing drivers and peripheral drivers and platform drivers, you will almost always just be on this side. You'll simply just be the person making the new, I think it's just super windy back there. Um, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, no, uh, uh, you just pretty much be doing leaf new error and then done. Uh, I think maybe I'll make my own new error function. All it does is simply call this thing, but it adds in, um, a, uh, let's make an arbitrary one function, uh, embed stack trace object. Um, that basically just captures the function that, that where this thing came from. Um, although I don't know if there's any way to actually capture the entire like line up to the point where, before you get to, uh, to this, uh, place here. So things I got to figure out. I'm still looking into this. So that is leaf for the most part. Um, any questions, comments, this one's a bit weird. So, uh, please, if you have any questions about this thing, please ask. Okie dokie. Uh, David, uh, how do you feel about uh, this Boost Leaf library? Good, this though should take a lot of the need to implement things away, which is nice. You know, I agree. Um, yeah, like, like I was, I was going back and forth with, uh, with like what to do for this and once I started designing it and someone has had recommended leaf and I look back and forth between, I realized that it very much was already on the path that I was going on. And I was like, if it fits the bill, then, you know, that then we should do that. And I think this works out pretty well. Um, cool. So I think this is good. Is this one like, hmm? oh. go for it. Is this one like, uh... <laughs> Is this uh, officially like part of the Boost library, or? I believe so. Yeah, yeah it's, it's actually part of the uh, the uh, the Boost. Uh, um, it actually tells you what which Boost uh, thing it was is a part of. But um, yeah, it is very much part of. Let's see. Um, let's go to GitHub. I'm pretty sure it tells you on the front. Yes, uh, Leaf is included in the official Boost releases. Starting with Boost 1.75, which I agree with you on, because like there are a lot of Boost projects that aren't in actual Boost or use the name Boost and are actually not affiliated with Boost, uh, which is a mood. But uh, yeah, no, this is actually part of Boost. Nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I think this is uh, uh, pretty exciting, and I really like this project. Um, but now to give you the bad parts of this, which is the fact that um, uh, there are a couple things that need to be, there are a couple to do. Some of them are pretty easy, like just improving or like just, just adding in a macro that will return a value back out, uh, which is only allowed in GCC and Clang. But I only think that GCC and Clang users are going to be the only ones that really use, are going to, you're not going to, you're, it's very, very rare you're going to be developing using a lib embedded HAL on anything that does not use Clang or GCC, period. But that's not the only issue. Because ARM GCC does not come with a, any thread support at all, which makes sense because you don't know if you use VRTOS, ThreadX or whatever, there's no std thread. And because there's no std thread, um, uh, because there's no std thread, um, um, what, uh, there's also no thread storage, uh, thread local storage. And the way that Leaf works is because it has that kind of global-ish object, or in a, another way to say, for every thread, there is another object that it uses to pinpoint where it stores all of its errors. We don't currently have that at the moment, or like, we don't have that at the moment, so you actually couldn't use Leaf with multi-threaded systems. It will have, it'll cause issues, they'll clobber each other. Um, if you enable threading, then it'll fail to compile. 
So I'm still adding in Leaf at the moment, and I'm investing in improving the actual library or working with the developer to help them improve the library if we can make this thing work uh, so that we can actually get this uh, to work for embedded systems that don't have uh, the thread, uh, the thread as a part of it. And they actually in their documentation say that they, they require the use of C++ 11 thread storage. We might be able to come up with an algorithm or a, a method of structuring things that eliminates that. So that would be exciting. Um, but I'll keep you guys tuned on that. But for now, we're going to be going with this and just be, we'll try our best not to develop any, any demos that really require uh, free RTOS or any type of uh, threading system. Uh, any last questions before I go over to the help wanted page? Alrighty. Our help needed. Uh, so, uh, just so you guys are, so people know about what things need to be done. Um, accelerometer, gyroscope, and compass interfaces, we don't have them. It would be nice if we did have them. So, if you're interested in trying to build those up, that'd be great. Accelerometer and gyroscope already, I'm sorry, accelerometer exists already in SJ Dev 2, but I think it's going to need to be lib embedded howled, you know, it needs to be like morphed to work with what we're doing. Gyroscope, that does not exist currently. So, we should probably um, like build that up. Compass is one that we have absolutely no details on. So like we, no one's built any of that and doesn't built a, a, a compass interface. So if anyone's interested in that, please, you know, that'd be great. Um, pseudo implementations. So I used to call them inactives back in SJDev2, uh, but I, I was thinking about that. And I wasn't sure if that made a lot of sense. So I think pseudo or like fake implementations makes more sense. So there'll be a, fa or a pseudo impl for PWM, basically just meaning that like this PWM does nothing. So you can use it for unit testing uh, and it could potentially just save the old previous values. Uh, well, that one, actually that'll be more on the mock side. I'll go into that in a sec, but the pseudo, the pseudo implementations are meant to be used to be super lightweight. You throw them into any project that basically uses like, let's say, let's say you have a project that needs 15 PWMs, but you, or like you have a driver that needs 15 PWMs and rather than give it null pointers, we just give it a uh, uh, one of those other objects. That means that it can call it to its heart's content and not have to worry about checking it before calling it. So we reduce the, you know, the need for more comparisons and we can just you know do the thing. Basically, we, it's, it's the thing, same thing as inactives in SGW2. If you're interested in that, I'd be more than happy to if people worked on that. Uh, unit testing, uh, we still need full, to finish this up. We need more testing for full scale um, so that we know that it works properly. Uh, enum, which is one function, so that should be super fast and easy. Stack memory resource, because uh, we want to make sure that it works as expected. Um, huh. I'm missing a section in here about mocks. So sudo is something that basically does almost nothing. It should be very lightweight. It should almost do basically nothing. And then mocks are there and meant for you to help you with unit testing. So we need mocks for I2C, SPI, UART. A mock would be something on the lines of like you take a UART and you say, hey, I want I want you to receive these bytes, this string of bytes. And then, you know, let's say, yeah, these string of bytes, uh, buffer these up. And then for TX, I want you to check to see if the TX equals this new, this particular value. And um, you can then query it saying, hey, you know, did, that, did, did the last thing that I asked you to do work? Maybe you can even have a sequence of things you're looking for. Um, uh, yeah, all that should be, it, it basically should make the idea and the, uh, the, yeah, the means of testing peripherals when, uh, or like mocking up peripherals to be used with other drivers that need them it should be super easy. Should, you should be able to develop an entire mock I2C um, that does read and write access and basically, you know, has like a whole memory map. So you can like, you know, update the memory map and then do the transactions back and forth and all that junk. But yeah, that's pretty much what we, uh, one of my items I'm missing here, but that's pretty much what we need right now um, is new, like interfaces, new interfaces, uh, unit testing and pseudo implementations. Um, so nothing that actually requires any sort of embedded knowledge. Like you don't need to know how to build a, uh, a, um, a driver using through registers. Not necessary. Uh, this work is plainly software. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it for t uh, for today's meeting. Any questions or comments? Let me change this real quick.
any area here that you'd want me to like kind of go back to so you can kind of get a look? Alrighty, I think that's pretty much good then. So I'm gonna cut out the recording.